and ensuring compliance uh, as part of the deposit workflow for a publication. Um, and the, the wonderfully named Date State State is a, uh, a support supporting plugin of that, which um, allows you to record dates in a way that is compliant. Um, and there are others in there as well. So the open access is something uh, is a plugin from Glasgow. So we're all very keen that there's a lively community, and uh, there are different ways to do things um, that we're happy to support. Um, open access is a plugin that's, that approaches the, OA, the 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 OA compliance in the workflow in a in a different way to Reox. Um, so then, as this is uh, about research data management, um, on the other side we have uh, some plugins that uh, will um, transform ePrints such that it is uh, more suitable for the description and storage of data sets. Um, so Recollect was a project that was run from Essex um, with some input, uh, significant input from Glasgow as well, around um, defining a metadata profile for um, research data and then creating a, a, a workflow for ePrints that allowed that to be recorded. Um, the data site DOI plugin is, uh, is something that uh, will manage the coining of um, DOIs for data um, and that quite interestingly that brings in an element of compliance as well um, around the data site metadata schema um, because you don't get your DOI unless you can send compliant metadata to them um, and so that manages that process. Uh, so we've already alluded to Archivum so there's a plugin that manages the interaction between um, the files that you upload to ePrints and um, how how they then proceed into the Archivum <coughs> network and their status, it reports back on the status in that network as well. Um, and also something that we've used uh, um, other items uh, that, that are generally data sets into packages that and then records a metadata against those uh, with the scope generally being project level metadata so for instance if you have a project it might have some metadata associated with it and you can gather together all the data sets um, that are associated with that project and, and present those in a single abstract but still have still be able to then go out and see the data sets on their own and they're specific metadata um, and yeah and the, it's a it's a it's a it's a, a busy um, area of plugin development at the moment and uh, so I have more question mark at the end <laughs> I won't go into that too much now but uh, <coughs> just, just to illustrate that it's uh, the, the, there's lots of stuff going on there um, okay Okay. Yeah. Uh, so now we come to some frequently asked questions. So that's a mix we get uh, from sort of one on one, -on -one conversations we have. Uh, uh, we've been to a couple of events recently where people kind of <coughs> kept asking the same question, um, and uh, also some of you um, filled in a little survey uh, as part of the process when you joined and signed up for this webinar. So we kind of going to run through those, um, um, hopefully answer the main questions, and then if there's more or if anything is unclear, uh, pop it into the public chat or into the Q&A, um, and we kind of hopefully cover those uh, in today's webinar. So if we go to the first one, uh, which was, how can we ensure we have appropriately structured metadata? And it was from Kath Dishman at Liverpool John Moores University. Um, Rory? Hello. <laughs> Excellent question. Um, okay, so in answer to this, um, I've given some. Uh, we'll look at some examples of um, schema, um, and and then realizing those schemas with workflows, and then the uh, the, the specific needs of diff some different institutions around those workflows. Um, and so there are. So the, uh, the appropriately structured metadata is um, 
uh, a very important thing in the first place to sort of uh, the first thing to look for are standards um, and in this example I've used the the data sites uh, metadata schema as a as a standard that I've mentioned before um, so you have the five mandatory properties so if you don't have these properties for your for your met on your data your data's metadata you won't get a data site DOI Pretty simple. Um, so this is a very big document, and there are lots of recommended and optional ones as well, which we'll look at later. But those top five are the ones that data site will require you to have before you um, will not even think about giving you a DOI. Um, so what we do then is uh, uh, we assess the institutional departmental needs um, because, well, everyone does that, I should say, customers do that more, more thoroughly um, to, to work out the way that, because each institution, depending on its uh, focus and each department, depending on what it is they do, will have different sorts of data and they'll, um, and they'll need to describe it in different ways. So the enormous document that I, we had a quick look at before has a whole load of options, um, and from that, it's uh, each institution or each department uh, can uh, can specify uh, on a, a set, a profile that suits them. Um, and one important thing. Uh, the consistency in the way they're described, then that's that's the best thing you can you can try and do. Um, it allows uh, to describe uh, every piece of uh, metadata in, for instance, the data site schema. Um, however, uh, it, it is possible to to tailor that workflow um, to your institutional needs and to get the and to get a, a, a good set and a consistent set so that all of your records, all of your data records have the the, the kind of metadata that you need. Um, so I shall quickly uh, run through some examples of this. So um, so one example of uh, a workflow that uh, may go some way in uh, making the uh, data site schema, for instance, um, manifest would be the uh, recollect one. So here's something from our demo, our data demo um, repository. Uh, I've just nicked some. I can't remember who's who, who made this record. Oh look, it's it's my old friend Richard from. Uh, LJMU. Um, so again, it's it's a, it's an ePrints workflow. It doesn't look too wildly different from a lot of things, but um, what it does is it uh, so there's a, 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 a it uses the work on, done by Essex and Glasgow previously to um, to make sure that this workflow that, that the metadata that comes out of after, after this workflow is suitably structured. For data, um, it's one way to do it. So if we hit next here, um, ooh, that's not what I wanted it to do. Let's try that again. Oh, that is the detail. So it's got it all on one page. So this will have the uh, the those core properties for data site, for instance. Um, but it also gives you lots of different things around. Uh, geographic coverage and geographic locations. Now, this is a sort of out of the box plugin that gets you started in most cases, um, but that sort of brings you onto the U part where it's uh, very much a, a different story uh, or, um, for different institutions. Um, so, we'll have another look. We'll move along the tabs here and we'll have a little look at this is the uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. This is, the data compass uh, data repository. Um, and here we see 
how the workflow has been manipulated so uh, that it suits this particular institution. Now, this institution has a focus, it's about um, data around uh, medicine. Um, so So that you don't, you're not presenting to your depositors. You know, if you can see it. Take focus, for instance. Uh, um, that's a, a more difficult thing to do. But um, so here we see. Uh, oh, there's a nice little um, addition that um, Gareth and the team. Uh, Managed to put in, which allows you to record that locational data a, a little bit more simply. Um, and and then uh, the depositor moves on and describes a bit more about how it was created. So then we have things like the uh, the creators, um, contributors, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, some related resources, a bit of information about faculty. all those things there. So this is uh, after a, a period of um, research by Gareth and consultation with us. This is how this is what we arrived on and a bit of work in house as well. Um, so that back to I will, slides, let's see if I do this and then do that again. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Note is that they are organized differently. So the creators here are on uh, Grouped together in this way, um, there's a, a, an option for actually putting in a custom DOI, your own DOI. Uh, uh, an important thing to note about that as well is that the workflow can be um, presented to different users in different ways. So the administrators uh, will see um, can see additional fields that you might not want to bother the your your, your researchers with when they're depositing, you want to maybe want to get a, a set of information um, from the researchers, and then in, during the period of review, you would um, then fill out some extra fields, um, so you don't you can tailor the workflow depending on who is looking at it. Um, from Reading. So here we can see, if I just flip, they've done quite a lot of uh, thinking and and, uh, um, and transferring of the start of the process before you, as opposed to at the end, oh, by the way, do you agree to all this we've just entered? They decided it would be more useful to have that up front. Um, and then it goes on to information about the data set, um, people and organized. So we just quickly scroll down. Are we scrolling here? I'll look this time. Okay, excellent. Um, so this is in, in many ways a, a reconfiguring of a lot of the a lot of the work done already by Essex um, around the recollect plugin. Um, but through the addition of a few bits and bobs that really suit the um, the particular institution. Um, then we have the people and organizations around that data. Um, uh, that's presented here. Um, some participating staff, rights holders, all very important information around funding and project. Um, and there's often a lot of debate within uh, <coughs> about the best way to present this stuff because it is vital. 
that it's um that it's recorded. Um, if I can show more examples, but I don't want to bore everyone with endless workflow diagrams. Um, but there are many examples of there's many, many ways to present that data. But the important thing is that that, that the underlying schema, the actual data itself, is consistent, even if you present it to your um, your your depositors in a different way, and you collect it in a different way. The important thing is that the underlying schema can be presented in a different um, in a consistent way. Sorry. Um, so okay. Move on. So there's a few more things here, additional details. So there's a lot of that geographic stuff. Um, and uh, around time period and, um, and data around that, metadata around that, and then finally there's publication details. And then at, right at the end, there's the option to actually upload the file. So different institutions do it different ways, and that's, uh, that's completely fine. Mm. Just to jump in on that, yeah, because um, having been on a few presentations with you now, Rory, uh, I think, so this was a good example of uh, a lot of the responsibility being on the depositor whoever that might be. Yeah. Um, and I remember there's some other customers of ours who basically if you do research or deposit or whatever that role is called, you upload the file and then someone else, research office, library, adds all those details and it kind of mm. yeah. reprints cables for that. Yeah, the different, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, exactly. The, the way you actually use the application is always up to you. So I, I think the University of East London, for example, um, have a completely, uh, totally moderated service. So the researchers um, might may just hand over a, a file to the uh, the team there, and they collect all the metadata on it, and they will fill in that form, um, which is um, possible mostly because they have quite a uh, a sort of small research effort at the moment there. Um, but obviously, the the larger your institution, it, the the more the uh, the more uh, beneficial it may be to sort of try and get your, your your researchers to fill in as much as they can themselves. But there are yeah, there's lots of flexibility in the way that it's presented to them, and indeed uh, to the staff who then have to review and. Okay, we just had a question. Uh -huh. um, how much technical metadata can be automatically extracted upon upload? Okay. Um, so at the moment, there's uh, it will do a, a simple bit of um, work around the file type, mime type, and so on and so forth. Um, there are so there are there have been previous efforts around ex metadata extraction with uh, ePrints, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, <coughs> we haven't haven't um, taken those on particularly with any of our customers. It's Bob's life, so. life demo. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> um, and here I see, and this is what's going wrong, is that we've obviously taken out of this bit of workflow, probably at, at the app request, that um, the bit about mime type. Oh, unless I can find that somewhere. So excuse me, I might click around. It's something that gets recorded, but um, it depends on the level of technical metadata. So. There we go. So there's some stuff here. Well, I think it's okay. I think. Yeah. So the the answer is yes. You can if you want to. Yeah, and obviously, if you're talking about um, quite a uh, full amount of technical metadata, then uh, there are methods to extract that um, of, to varying degrees of success and. Um, Deprints has a plugin architecture that allows you to do that. And I know there has been work on this in the past, so it could be a matter of finding that old plugin and brushing it down and, and, and giving it a whirl. Okay. 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 So go back to these. Um, any more questions around that? Or? No, I think that was good. Okay. Uh, well, one of the questions which I hopefully answered publicly, um, Donna asked if University of Reading Research Data Archive is powered by ePrints. The answer is yes. Yes. All the examples we are showing today they are, are yeah. based on ePrints, seeing it's what we are using. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. We, 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 we find it uh, flexible enough to, to, to meet most requests. So that's, that's. Okay. And now, while we use it, um, 
Okay, so okay. next uh, question. Next question was, uh, how can we make sure metadata is only entered once, no duplication of effort? And it was from Rachel Proudfoot at okay. University of Leeds. So, a, a burning a burning topic. Um, because the last thing that anyone wants to do is present their, their researchers with yet another web form. Um, and the answer is, as far as, although it's a difficult one, the answer is as far as possible, to um, to integrate where you can with <coughs> your um, with other systems. So if there's already a system in your institution where the researchers are, or someone is uh, library staff, whoever it may be, uh, um, entering metadata, then we will um, certainly have in the past made um, efforts to to uh, use that metadata as far as we can to create the records in ePrint, so you don't have to have uh um, as a third-party uh, system uh, that many institutions have for their research information. So it's more around the publications, but it's a good example of where we, where we integrate. Um, and of course, there, there are there are various uh, tools to allow integration that we um, that we've used. Um, we've got some examples of those in a bit. Um, again, there are often uh, in-house systems for managing whether it be research data or publication metadata that are already well in use, well established, and well embedded. Um, it may be the case that people don't want to particularly completely throw their systems away, um, but they do see the advantage of having um, a repository solution sort of sitting in the background. Um, and again, this is something that we can do in terms of integrating those in-house systems. Obviously, they are um, each one is different, um, but usually those that they can they often meet some uh, com uh, some standards around import. Uh, yeah, we just had a question about. Uh Part of our offering, um, no, because it's a proprietary. System. No, yeah, that's that's something you'd have to take up with um, who does that one? Digital science, whatever, symplectic. Mm. Um, that's a that's a third party piece of kit that um, that is uh, that we are we we do have a, a good relationship um, with them in terms of working out how the integrations work. So we we can. Um, help with the integration of that and the crosswalking of metadata from one system to the other, but yeah, that's a, a separate system. Um, and just to, to draw attention to the last one on there, which um, is something of uh, something of a newbie here that uh, we'd like to see more of. That's that, of course, metadata can be harvested from ORCID. So again, around researchers. Um, Publication, so a, a, a individual researchers' publication outputs can be um, can be uh, collected um, and looked after by ORCID, and then that metadata can be um, imported into ePrints. So uh, some examples of these. So a quick example of an in-house system. So um, so for this is the publications. Repository for we harvest stuff from their uh, in house publication database, and I'm going to add an example here to, to move that further down. So here you see, so it's not very exciting, but. Uh, <laughs> is the ID that proves that that's been the case, and of course that then gives you a link between the two systems. Um, and the, I believe, if we just now go to, um, um, go to the abstract for this, that I'm logged in. Um, do we have? Uh, it might be down the bottom here. 
you can view this record in the publications database. So um, that's a, an internal system that's not for the outside world, not just for, it's, it's almost like a little in-house Chris uh, um, and our integration means that that's where the, the data goes in. Um, I don't think many of the, pub the publication metadata in this particular institution is generally not entered by the researchers into ePrints. It comes via the publication database. Um, so another example someone raised was about symplectic. So St George's um, for a long time have been using symplectic and um, and here we have a record where I can just show that um, that there's uh, notes being imported here from Chris. And further down, we have a bit more stuff about the, the uh, elements actor. And um, again, we, we move across. The data goes in. So that's hopefully answered a bit of your question. Um, I've got a data example, I realise that. Um, um, oh, but, uh, okay. okay, we had another question. Go on. To you Not having of that, um, best way to learn about anything. More answer that one, maybe. Instead of giving the hand wavy. Apply to various uh, standards. I'm sure they do. Um, and I know that there are some institutions out there who have uh, some time. Uh, I believe that the, the, the Loughborough example of share and archive and does involve a repository in there as well. Um, it's just worth pointing out that there are. can be um, harvested um, using OAI PMH by services like Ethan Open Air. Um, RSS feeds can be dropped into uh, research and faculty pages. So again, it becomes a single point of entry for metadata that can be reused. Um, so some of the interfaces that, 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 that um, sort of govern, as I mentioned, OAI PMH, um, there's a, um, there's, a, there's a CRUD interface that allows you to do quite a lot of work in and out of ePrints. Um, and I know that's, that's something that uh, a lot of system integration um, uses. Uh, and that, that does give a lot of flexibility, um, certainly with that for us to, uh, to work out the best fit. Um, and I'm sure fit, I can include Figshare in that in uh, theoretical terms only, I'm afraid. What solutions and interfaces and various different systems you're using. So one of the questions we had from City and MMU is uh, aiming at a single user interface solution for all systems. Um, so that's an interesting uh, point uh, that's being raised and we thought um, just because we've done a lot of talking for now uh, we can actually do a poll. So just change the screen a bit um, and asking you guys to answer that simple question. So how many different systems do you currently use to manage research? Just enter and cast your vote. Give it a few seconds to see what happens. 
Okay, well, so I like a bit of real life data. Um, <laughs> you should be able to see the results as you <laughs> cast your vote. Eurovision <laughs> 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 Yeah, well, it's a, it's a tough race between Germany and UK who gets the lowest <laughs> points, I think. Um, uh, okay, that's interesting. So it looks like the majority of you use between one and three different systems. Okay. Uh, handful between four and six, and just one lonely person, more than six. Um, uh, okay, that's very interesting. Um, thanks for that. Uh, I wasn't sure. I was expecting more people to be yes. sort of in the middle, but um, that's that's okay. That's that's, that's a good thing. I yeah. Think in, in, yeah. The le the less the merrier. Yeah. Yes. And, and 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 it, and it gives the the possibility of that single that single user interface. It makes it much more attainable. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. No, definitely. So following on from that, um, we have a. Um, again, one is words couldn't possibly describe how excited you would be about that. <laughs> um, uh, going down to five. Okay, interesting. Um, so, if we're looking at a previous question, which had sort of between one and three, uh, now people are obviously very keen to have sort of one view of the world, mm -hmm. um, easy access. I mean, one thing we mentioned previously is the uh, DMA online. Is yeah. That so, in terms of the view, that's a nice. Uh, that's a. Um, and yes, we are. We have we have lodged our interest with um, uh, Masood on that in terms of ePrint integration, and he has launched it back again in terms of yes, that would be a great thing in terms of using ePrint as a data source for the DMA online. Um, that gives you a nice view that that single place for a view for a, a lot of this stuff and potentially more. Um, and it's a very interesting project. Obviously, it's in its infancy at the moment, but um, I know that there's a, there's a lot of um, interest in it. Um, one thing that doesn't do, of course, is is a, is a user interface, a single user interface. And that's a mm. oh hello. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. Oh. Is a single user interface for. Researchers would be greater than the people who had to administer it there, where they, but then of course they they can add into the mix if you like whenever they're doing their research a lot more. They probably have they, if you, I I would imagine um a lot of the researchers sort of work through a project that they're going to be interacting with more than more than one to three uh, user interfaces if we include things like their. Um, Publication submissions and all that sort of stuff, but um, I think that uh, taking a single view over this stuff and, and working out those inter integrations with something like DMA online is a is a is a really interesting first step into sorting it sort, sorting this stuff out. Um, and like I said, by the results of the. Uh, <laughs> Good. Um, okay. Go. Okay. Oh, we've done the poll. So, we've done the poll. Uh, ah. so one of the questions, obviously, uh, if we if we talk about research data management solution in terms of a service we provide uh, to institutions, one of the questions we get asked quite a lot is um, how do we manage support? Um, how can people get in touch with us? Obviously, there's SLAs, and and you kind of want to make sure that you get what you pay for. Um, so. Uh, what we do at the moment, we have a tool called ServiceNow, which is um, basically ITIL compliant. So for those of you who don't know, ITIL is a, 
term for managing change in a service provision and managing IT provision. Um, so basically we have a portal and you can reach that via service desk, via, via an email, via call, via self-service portal, block a call that creates a ticket number which gets tracked uh, and resolved and you get updates on it. Um, and you can also log incidents so that if something isn't working as it's supposed to according to the SLAs. But you can also look additional requests, so that's additional work on top of what's been agreed. Um, and what we get with ServiceNow is sort of a nice kind of paper trail, audit trail, uh, which ensures that uh, effectively we don't change anything on your system that hasn't been authorized by someone who has the authority to request a change. So that's kind of in a nutshell, I would say. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think that's good. If anybody has questions on that, mm -hmm. raise your hands or put it in the chat. Or yeah, I hope that's a long one. Yeah, do you want to re read the question and I read? Through okay. It? Um, okay. So maybe. Puts to its IR. Um, G custom working series and research data sets. So I've got um, a couple of examples here, and obviously we're talking about uh, RDM solution as a specific platform, um, and this is just to highlight the fact that uh, one option is that your publications repository um, can take an awful lot of stuff. I meant to fix this phrase. Sorry. Um, I'll just scroll down a bit, but I can't. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this is just an example uh, from the, the uh, London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine again, of a, a, a range of things that can go into a, an e-prints. Um, so um, articles, book sections, monographs, uh, books, theses, patents, artifacts, um, so on and so forth, data sets. Which interestingly is a is a legacy thing because uh, they now have a, another platform specifically for data sets, which presents the metadata for that stuff uh, in a in a way that um, is more suited to the data set and, and the metadata. Um, um, and a podcast is uh, something that's uh, an additional service that. Um, we worked with um, LSATM on in terms of uh, defining that. It's quite simple to add types of, of as well. Um, so this is just an example of a different type. Um, there we go. So we get a SoundCloud embedded sort of SoundCloud player in there, um, so that the different uh, types of item is a, good, a nice example of the other different types of item uh, and how you can integrate it. Um, so the other thing I mentioned, of course, is specifically around data, is the the, the sort of separate platform approach. So here's another example from um, Sheffield Hallam. Um, another example of, of, of more work. Of, another example of a way of uh, draw attention to is that the uh, as I was talking about the the different ways of um, of moderating or not the deposit. So what the guys at Sheffield Hallam are doing is that they get their researchers. To just uh, to input the location of the data files. This is on their um, on their, on their sort of network storage system that they have there in house. So they just say, give me the address of that file or those files or the directory where your data is. The depositor wouldn't see this here that I'm trying to point out. Um, upload stage. That's just for uh, the repository administrators or the staff. So they would then go and uh, get this file, whatever the, the researcher puts in here, and 
I'm loading it, so that's another way. And then they move on to the, the entry in the call, the metadata, so on and so forth. Um, so that's so that's the, the so generally I've been showing lots of examples of, of the data repository, but the approach of just putting data into your institutional repository, it's not um, it's not impossible, but um, there's um, just thinking to do around the sort of metadata you're already collecting in that repository and, and how to. Could be a could be a, an idea that works. So. Okay, um, just read through Lawrence's question. Okay. Um, so he said uh, one problem with our the M system for our researchers, i.g., Chris to ePrints or Kyvum, is that it will be likely to be seen as some by some or many as an imposition on the existing RDM workflows, mm -hmm. and they refuse to use it despite advocacy, advocacy, high level support, etc. Have we encountered that issue with the AGIs we work with? Um, maybe they're being nice to me by not passing this stuff on. But I don't know if there's open revolt with some of our customers around around um, around the data workflow um, that the, the, that's already there. Um, but I'd be I'd be very interested to know. Maybe I'll ask. I know I'd be uh, um, Eddie from Sheffield Hallam and Robert from Reading and I will all be up at RDMF talking a bit about that. And there and those guys will be talking more about their experiences within the institution um, so if they have had uh, um, any problems in that area I'm sure they, they they'll, they'll be talking about those um, no. but yeah uh, I, I, I can't answer that in too much detail but always interested to try and to try and look at ways of where the technology can help as much as possible, but obviously the people are, are vital. I mean, it's worth saying that where this stuff um, has been embedded really well, um, LSHDM being a really good example, uh, is is largely due to the amount of work, not that we've done, but that Gareth Knight has done in terms of advocacy, uh, workshops and focus groups, and, and, and just taking the researchers through it. I mean, it, it helps that there's focus and, and right. um, a, a specific sort of way of doing things there already but uh, yeah can't, can't, I can't uh, stress the importance of, of, of uh, a person to, to make this stuff really work. Okay well that's a good point I mean from my own experience I think it's uh, having talked to some customers as they were kind of about to embark on the project steps back, mm. he sees the bigger picture and kind of makes sure everybody gets what they want, but also is aware that yeah. it's kind of a team effort, which yeah. I know is a bit of a vague answer, but it's kind of yeah. a, that was yeah. the impression I had. Yeah. Um, I think sort of anecdotally as well, we've been doing a, a survey and a, a different um, set of work to, to the ePrints about um, research data management and research information. And what we, and not necessarily our customers, it, it's been throughout um, UK HEIs, and one thing that we found people are saying is that with the, the funder requirements and specifically for research data, with the data sets growing, um, that there is getting to be hopefully more engagement with the researchers because they're starting to realise that they can't handle this all on their own. Um, so that some in some instances their old workflows are just not supportable. So mm. hopefully uh, that, that will help in the future as well as things change a bit. Okay. Have done, someone's asked if we've done any integrations with yeah. Pure. Pure? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we have. <laughs> um, um, the one thing I can say is that, uh, and this is possibly, um, uh, I'll let you decide whether it's a good or a bad thing, but we haven't had to do too much work with Pure. Um, so there are, we know they have customers who um, do the integration, but they, 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 they generally use that CRUD interface I've uh, uh, mentioned before. Um, and that just seems to work, and we don't get too many requests saying, ah, this thing isn't working because of ABC. So possibly a, a positive for the pure integration, but I, I honestly don't know how it works. <laughs> okay. Cool. Uh, we had a question from Glenn in the Q&A. We'll get back to that uh, 
once we run through the slides, so Steph can have a little think yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to formulate her answer. Uh, so we got that. Uh, should we I'm move on? Right. I'm conscious that we're kind of almost yes. running out of time. Sorry. Uh, so obviously one of the questions we had as part of this whole conversation is how to fund a technical solution and it was from Robert at City University. So um, I'm just going to show you a quick um, example of our pricing and run you through it. Um, uh, and like I said, slides are available later so you can kind of look at it in more detail and peace and quiet. But basically kind of what we do, we split charges between one of charges, so that means you start, set up, etc. Um, they usually include an audit uh, and a migration if you already have a system and want to migrate either from your own in-house ePrints or another system. So we've done DSpace. The average customer pays with us. Um, uh, so you have a couple of one-off charges which you pay in the first year. And then you have what we call annual subscription charges. So our contracts are on an annual basis. They renew. Uh, some customers decide to sign up with us a longer term and commit, uh, which is good for us and them because we kind of both know where we're at. Um, but basically, you get a research technology subscription, uh, which includes hosting, man time, couple of days support, uh, three, uh, I'm getting the point. Um, and then you have a hosted service. So a hosted service in our terms is a repository. So if you had a publications repository and a data repository, that number would be a two rather than a one. Uh, and then obviously kind of to be compliant and meet the long-term preservation uh, angle of the requirements, uh, there's an archiving subscription and we start usually customers off with one terabyte archive and storage, which for most of them is plenty to start with. Yeah. To start with, um, um, and that sort of brings you to just under nine grand, kind of on an annual basis. So first year charges would be just below twelve k, and then um, annual charges around nine k. Again, this is an average size. Uh, we have customers that pay a bit less uh, if they don't have any audit or migration or start from scratch, it kind of gets cheaper for them in the first year. Uh, but we also have customers, uh, a handful I would say, who probably pay twice as much because they want more development time, uh, more help with integrations, etc., uh, more storage. So it's kind of, it's flexible and grows with you as your needs grow. Um, so, I've got some good questions. From yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to read as I talk. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just like, going to get back to Glenn. On the okay. Yeah. Do you want to be Glenn? Time. Okay. Yes. The short answer is yes, Glenn, to that. Mm -hmm. um, there was a there was a workflow for managing the normalization and continuing migration during the life cycle. It would depend. I'm looking at Rory because it depends how whether it was going into archive and how we wanted to actually do the workflow. Um, so, to support that, so I'm looking at the question. Yeah, I've been reading the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the um, okay, yeah, so the, well, the archive and um, guarantee. Um, we have a bit of experience in terms of the, the, pres the theory of preservation, we know exactly what you're talking about and uh, looking at the uh, possibility of offering this as a service yeah. as well um, that would that would help with um, that sort of uh, normalization of file types on ingest such that what, you're not just chucking stuff into uh, archive and such that they return you a, a perfectly uh, exact copy of something that you then can't use because it's got a, uh, an out of date or a defunct file type of some sort. So, um, yeah, a waffly answer. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. That's I, I think the short answer is yes. The, the longer answer would be that we talk to you in more detail about your specific needs if, if you were actually wanting to go ahead with, yep. with using that as part of the service. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are, um, <clears throat> ePrints does have um, file conversion plugins, for instance, as part of yeah. that you can work into, the, put into the workflow to uh, to do uh, some level of normalization. And, and again, it's uh, the sorts of those um, specifics around those might be um, something you can implement. 
Um, okay, I get. Uh, I'm just run through the chat. Um, yep. I think Steph, if you can take a note, uh, probably as a follow up, provide some more information yep, to your Chris that. integration. Um, also, there was an earlier point. It's about Fixture. Um, so yeah, the, I'm, I'm looking at Rory yeah. and saying <laughs> blog yeah. post. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll, 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 yeah. I can. I'll look into how they've done it. There's a couple there. Um, my, I mean, my, my instinct is that they've just used the Eprint Scrud interface to do their integration, but I will find out more about that. Um, I did notice that David has just above that one has asked about the archive and cache that we offer each customer. So it's worth pointing out what we what what we do with Archivum and how we're able to offer the service that we do around that is that we um, we have uh, an A store uh, here in our um, data center. Um, and that has around 34 terabytes um, of cache. Customers, um, so we keep an eye on on what's going on and review the our needs with archive. And so, if we need to add more devices or more capacity to that cache, then we do. Um, but that would be an ongoing process of review with, with between us and archive. Um, but at the moment, we don't. Uh, the, the technology doesn't allow us to sort of delineate. So each customer gets their own data pool. So the the data is distinct and uh, therefore it goes to escrow distinctly. It has its own encryption. Um, so in that sense, it's distinct. But in terms of the use of the A store as cash, um, that's basically first come, first served. And then uh, last looked at, first deleted, <laughs> as cash is off. OK, we had another question sort of digital preservation. Um, unless I'm wrong, I know that because you track stats and access in ePrints, and yep. so you could easily run a report, show me everything that hasn't been accessed, so, looked at yeah. in 10 years. This is, a, this is also um, an interesting development I've been working with um, Shepard Hallam with as well, uh, about doing this a bit better. As, um, so access is managed, to access to the item is managed by ePrints. There are stats around download for that. Um, but the um, uh, actually keeping a, a, a sort of continuous date of last access metadata against a document is something that um, Eddie um, is keen for me to get on with. Um, and I think that's something that would, would be a really uh, a potentially very useful piece of information that will, uh, of course, we'd roll out to our other data repository customers. OK. That's good. There's a few. Okay, pure. Yes, Dave, we've got that, so we can make a note that. Uh, no. All right, I think uh, we sort of reached the end. Oh, just about on time, slightly over. Yep. Um, Try to catch any of those queries that we weren't able to answer. Yeah. Um, um, so if you want to contact us, uh, just email us. Uh, email you see now or tweet us uh, on Twitter. Uh, we're reasonably busy <laughs> checking in every now and then. Um, unless there are any other questions, I would say, um, well, first of all, thanks Rory and Steph for uh, helping out, answering questions, especially Steph, freshly <laughs> jet lagged from oh, a 26 hi. hour flight. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, like Rory mentioned, Rory will be at the RDMF yeah. in about three weeks' time. No, Andrew and Antonius. Jesus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Getting your names wrong there. Um, but thank you very much for your time. Uh, any questions, ping us, follow up with us, and um, hopefully see you soon at another one of those. Okay. in the near future. Yep. Cheers. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks very much. Bye.